That was an excerpt from Handel's Water Music, composed in 1717 for George I. It was performed on the Thames, and so delighted King George that each time its players got to the end, he asked them to begin again. Hello and welcome to Ear Read This. Today we are talking about a book also called Water Music, and although it kicks off 80 years and two Georges later, it shares that first George's insatiability. Water Music is the first novel by T.C. Boyle, originally published in 1981. It begins in 1795 and tells the story of real-life Scottish explorer Mungo Park's expeditions into the dark interior of Africa as he attempts to map the River Niger. Why have I heard water music before? Because it's a. It was written by Handel. It's oh, Handel's water music. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was commissioned by George the First to be performed on the water, oh. on one of his jaunts up the Thames. And it was. It was performed on um, in 1717. I've heard water music. Yeah, I know. I know. I know, I know which one it is now. Um, and he uh, famously knackered the musicians by playing it again and again and again. <laughs> Just insisting, like, they just repeat. Even without the Handel anecdote, this novel has a note of excess, of insatiability. Water music being the music of the sea, rapids, falls, rain, and most pertinently here, rivers. All of these natural songs are continuous and infinite. They have no beginning, no end, and they are performed by an orchestra ranging from colossal timpani breakers to molecular plashes and ploshes. When George I heard that music on the Thames and said, give me excess of it, the musicians obliged him. T.C. Boyle gives a performance of a different kind, but in the same spirit, ecstatic and excessive. Reviewers are often unfavourable to books that revel in excess. It's far easier to recognise delights when it only comes round once every hundred pages. This is not that kind of book. Water Music is a novel to trough on. Loosen your trousers, close all the windows to keep the stink in, and tilt in head first. Indulgence is a dirty word in literary criticism, the sin of indulgence usually being levelled at everything but the plainest prose. By a sea change contrast, everything about water music smacks of excess. Its cup runneth over. Like any river worth its salt, it has many tributaries, breaking away from the main thrust of the Niger expeditions to trickle down through mini-biographies of characters, historical trivia and restagings. It is set in extravagant times and written in an extravagant style. So it's appropriate that its characters too forget to say when. Ned Rise, who who wishes to rise above his miserable beginnings and enter the world of commerce, can never resist the criminal slipstreams and their twinkling rewards. Ned, we learn, is a victim of, among other things, ignorance and gin, and he's not the only victim of the latter, as Boyle tells us in one of the many historical interludes. By 1710, the streets were littered with drunks, some stripped naked, others stiff as tombstones. When Sir Joseph Jekyll, master of the rolls, introduced legislation to curb the pernicious influence of gin through licensing and taxation, a mob gathered to stone his house and chew the wheels from his carriage. There was no stopping it. Gin was a palliative for hard times. It was sleep and poetry. It was life itself. This isn't the only occasion in the novel where people act like piranha, whether for gin or bloodlust or love, We get a recurring sense of people swarming, ruthless want embodied in extreme, comical ways. When we first meet Ned's love interest, Fanny, description and character are matched in excess. They collide. Knowing the nature of water music's river folk by now, we have a sense here of a pork chop being lowered into a broiling tank. Fanny Brunch was fresh from the creamery. Her breath was hot with the smell of mink... Mink? Milk. And it whispered of cribs and nipples and the darkness of the womb. Her skin was cream, her breasts cheeses, there was butter in her smile. When she was fifteen, two country louts hacked one another to death over her, with hose. The following year, the local squire abducted her and bound her to his bed. They found him in his nightshirt, the bed a sea of feathers, red welts stippling Fanny's buttocks. So for some it's gin, and for some it's Fanny. But the poison of our main character, Mungo Park, is adventuring. Had you heard of Mungo Park? No, I I am completely blind on this one. So he's a Scottish adventurer. Well, because Mungo is a very Scottish name. Yeah, it, I, it's like I'd never heard it. It's all over Glasgow. Really? Mung, Mungo everywhere. But but contemporary Mungos? No. No. Centuries old Mungos. Oh. Okay. The only contemporary Mungo I know of is Mungo Jerry. Mungo Jerry, who's that? Well, he's uh he sang a song called Summertime, but Mungo Jerry he named himself after one of the cats in Practical. Cats. Oh, right. So I think yeah. Mungo Jerry is the name of one of the cats. In um, Possum's book yeah, of... That's the one, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, okay. I've never actually... That's all I know about that. the name Mungo, though. No. So he, he was an adventurer. He was born in Selkirk. Okay. In 
in our in what is fast becoming our period um, <laughs> in 1771. Um, so, a couple of years, or was it actually the year of Johnson and Boswell's Sally, or a couple of years before? It's on either side of. Uh, the first book was 75. Yeah. I think that was Johnson's. So, yeah. That, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're within a year or two. Yeah. Um, and then he studied to become a surgeon in Edinburgh. As uh, Everybody seems to have studied in Edinburgh at this Everyone, point. Okay, that was the only yeah. thing that was going on. And then he started doing adventuring. And so he went I, to Sumatra. Oh, for the world, yeah, where you can just become an adventurer. There is a boy's own factor to this, isn't there? All of this stuff. What's the modern day equivalent of being an adventurer? Oh. Is it doing your own startup business? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Something like that. Sex robots. I just, it seems it seems like there's nothing left to discover. But back in the day, you could just get on a boat and go find a new island. Name a few fish. Yeah. He did, um, he came back, he's really, really young, and he did a speech to the the Linnaeus or the Linnaean Society, named after Charles Linnaeus, and talked about five or eight new fish that he discovered on his Sumatra trip as a, you know, just as an guy in his early 20s, yeah. Boiled, insatiable characters are a product of their time. We hear early on that... Now, at the end of the Age of Enlightenment and the beginning of the Age of Inbursement, France wanted the Niger, Britain wanted it, Holland, Portugal and Denmark. Simple yet outrageous wants, wanting a river. You have no rivers in your own country, an African asks Mungo. Mungo isn't alone in his overconfidence and ignorance, and he's not alone in trying to map the dark interior either. We hear the fate of John Ledyard, who went before him, a man who had travelled with Captain Cook, so should have been well qualified. I've tramped the world under my feet, he said, laughed at fear, derided danger, through hordes of savages, over parching deserts, the freezing north, the everlasting ice and stormy seas have I passed without harm. How good is my lord? Two weeks after landing at Cairo, he died of dysentery. The flip side of the children of the Enlightenment's thirst for adventure is not only squalid and sticky ends such as this, and the melancholic realisation that one cannot discover something twice, but also the legacy of colonialism. The African association which employs Mungo is a private club where distinguished gentlemen argue about which way the Niger flows and send lunatic explorers out to shit themselves to death across the channel. All very harmless and innocent. However, this enthusiasm for chiefly theoretical exploration would intoxicate and galvanise the imperialist colonisers to come. Bottomless appetites aren't only left to the Europeans. We spend a few chapters in the company of a queen called Fatima, who takes a shine to Mungo. This section not only includes a recipe for a whole baked camel, serves 400, but also gives Mungo a taste of his own medicine. It is during his first expedition, and already we have seen that he is foolhardy, naive, and completely unprepared, constantly pushed into dangerous situations by his curiosity. How fitting that the natives tell him he has cat's eyes. As Fatima stares into these, Mungo hears another's curiosity, as intense, threatening and dangerous as his own. She wanted to dissect and absorb his habits. England, Europe, the vast and uncertain oceans. She wanted them built of words. She wanted visions. She wanted the memories behind his eyes. She too, in other words, wanted far more than she could have. No wonder why these two get along. Mungo never better describes his character, his age, or his novel when he confesses during sex with Fatima that my sight is rabid pleasure. Adventuring professionalism soon kicks in. It's a dream, an attack of fever. No mere mortal could approach this magnificence. He scrambles atop her, feeling for toeholds. So much terrain to explore. Mountains, valleys and rifts. New continents, ancient rivers. Despite the carnage Mungo leaves in his wake, the full horror of imperial colonialism is still a way off. What we are reading is its prequel. The carnage that serves for the drama of the book, or at least the first expedition, is local and personal. Here T.C. Boyle describes how he got interested in Mungo's story. I was doing my PhD in 19th century British literature and was reading John Ruskin, who mentions that Mungo Park was a terrific hero who went to discover the River Niger. But look what he did to his family. He left his wife and kids behind, took off on this adventure and died. Interesting. Uh, at what age is he asked to map the Niger? 24. Bloody hell. I mean, he makes, he, he puts himself forward, but he, um, he meets with a guy called Joseph Banks. Who, um, who pays for the, the voyage. Well, yeah, he's the director or, or the, the unofficial director of the African Association. And he was um, a botanist on um, Captain Cook's ah, voyages. Very interesting. So he knew voyaging. He, he, he did it. He'd, he'd been and been come back again. Maybe Cook was dead at this point. 
Cook was, Cook was bludgeoned to death, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, I think he was bludgeoned to death around then. He was bludgeoned to death by somebody he'd enslaved, I'm pretty sure, wasn't it? No, it was. he landed on an island and then there was some kind of miscommunication, a mm. tribe misunderstanding. And they just kill him. Kill him, kill a lot of the people. I think they all ended up in the pot. Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, well. I don't think much was Cook lost. by I think. name. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that Cook was a, a bit of a bastard, so... Because mm. I, I was going to suggest we do some of Cook's um, journals. Oh, we totally can. I think he just might reveal how much of a bastard he was. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not as if we n- wouldn't have bastards on. Yeah. But, um, it, um, I mean, Boswell comes across as a complete bastard. Yeah. But he's a little bit more open. I think I think he may... The bastard may be belied by if you read Cook's journals and he's just talking about stuff that was fine back then. Just popped on this bit of land. It's Her Majesty's now. I think this would be a great place to send the blacks and the Irish. Yeah, okay. That sort of bastard. Yeah. But no, Mungo gets sent to map the Niger at sure. the age of 24. He travels a, a good way up it, farther than any white man has been before. Mm-hmm. Um, and then things go pretty wrong. Do they go a bit higher darkness? Um, well, in the sense Or is it more go, like Fitzcarraldo? A bit more like Fitzcarraldo. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In 1795, Park began his expedition travelling up the River Gambia for 200 miles. He entered the unknown territory of the Senegal River Basin, caught fever, and was caught himself by an Arab chief. After four months in prison, he escaped with a horse and a compass. It was now more than a year since he had set off. Finally, he reached the Niger in Mali on July the 20th, 1796. After travelling it downstream for 80 miles, he had to turn back before he could map the extent of its true course. With no supplies, he made his return journey on foot, spent seven months battling fever in Mandingo country, and eventually made it back to England on December the 22nd, 1797. He had been gone two years and seven months and was widely suspected to be dead. Uh, long presumed dead. Um, two years go by. Uh, and then he finally... He wanders makes, out of the jungle. Basically, he wanders out of the jungle and makes his way home to England. Has a, a crew. He has um, an assistant called Johnson. Okay. Um, a local who features in water music. Johnson in the novel is paid for his services in the works of Shakespeare. The real Johnson got ten bars a month and five for his wife. From the beginning, we know that Boyle is going to be cheekily parting from history. We first discover Mungo bearing his buttocks to the Moor who kidnapped him. Boyle writes in in an apologia prefacing his novel, As the impetus behind water music is principally aesthetic rather than scholarly, I've made use of the historical background because of the joy and fascination I find in it, and not out of a desire to scrupulously da- dramatise or reconstruct events that are a matter of record. I have been deliberately anachronistic, I have invented language and terminology, I have strayed from and expanded upon my original sources. Where historical fact proved a barrier to the exigencies of invention, I have, with full knowledge and clear conscience, reshaped it to fit my purposes. So joy and fascination are the twin streams here, and the easiest point on which to recommend water music is its joyful prose, which comes pretty hard and fast. Its rivers are pregnant, jumping banks, fanning down trees, giving birth to torrents. There are playful similes floating by. Ned whirled, skirts crepitating like a hidden audience. And splashes of Wodehouse. Lady B's face hardened past simple petrification, through the igneous phase, the metamorphic, and beyond and an endless bubbling up of references. Not Twist, not Copperfield, not Fagin himself had a childhood to compare with Ned Rises. Dickens wasn't yet born, of course, but this is an endless and roaring river, and as such is bound to churn up some anachronistic flotsam here and there. It is a testament to Boyle's spirit that he can write what could plainly be described as a historical novel and make all kinds of modern references, not to mention ventriloquise historical characters talking like present-day or at least late 20th century Americans. It works because it's the right tone, the right spirit. Irreverent, all-devouring and far too restless to fanny about with reconstructing 18th century verbiage. That doesn't mean that we miss out on excess in an 18th century style. My favourite character, Georgie Glegg, is a luckless Scot who falls for Mungo's wife whilst he's off mapping the Niger. Glegg is one of life's victims, and in a book full of life's victims, he distinguishes himself as their patron saint. Though rejected by Ailey, Mungo's wife, Glegg won't take the hint, and Ailey finds herself glegged to the gills. She can't crack an egg without hearing about the blushing morn of her cheeks or the foaming billows of her breasts. And in my favourite detail, she finds love lyrics tucked between her oatcakes. 
You can't navigate prose so soaked with good lines without now and again losing a welly in the mud. When a character enters a building and an anemic bell murmurs overhead, you can possibly lose a few minutes wondering how a bell's anemia is articulated via its murmur. And you can't help noticing iron deficiency has struck again on the following page where there burns an anemic flame. But any fretful minutes wasted worrying that you've missed the great buried anemia theme here are redeemed a few sentences later by the wonderful lightning that plays over the horizon like the flicker of ideas. I make this rather petty double anemic reference not because it truly clogs or clots the stream of Boyle's prose but because its strangeness highlights the usual excellence and aptness of his writing elsewhere. If all his bells were anemic, one could say that with full severity that his prose was as purple as their fingertips, but not so when someone gives off laughter like the throttling of birds, or coughs like dice in a box. Those are full-blooded similes in anyone's book, but they immediately belong to water music. They are wonderfully in tune with its outbursts of random violence and its diseased fortune. An even more on-the-nose, or just-above-the-nose example, his brow swells out over his face like an eroded riverbank. After Johnson calls Mungo's writing bullshit, the adventurer replies, Can you imagine how unutterably dull it would be if I stuck strictly to the bald, bare facts without a hint of embellishment? The good citizens of London and Edinburgh don't want to read about misery and wretchedness and 37 slaves disemboweled, old boy. Their lives are grim enough as it is. No, they want a little glamour, a touch of the exotic and the out of the way. And what's the harm of giving it to them? So Boyle's hero, like his creator is loose with the facts and has aesthetic principles. But for a man of science, this does a great deal of harm indeed. Lucky for us, Boyle is a novelist, and we can read water music as he wrote it, with full knowledge and clear conscience. Boyle's exuberant style wasn't born solely from the historical background, but the literary one as well. In The Rambler in 1750, Dr Johnson wrote of novels which are such as exhibit life in its true state, diversified only by accidents that daily happen in the world and influenced by passions and qualities which are really to be found in conversing with mankind. This could well describe water music, which in fine Tristram Shandy style is digressive and it is progressive too, and at the same time. Just as style and content are not divisible, it is not correct to say Boyle is interrupting the narration to comment on small details. For one thing, they are often deployed to useful dramatic effect. Diversions into the cultural history of the crocodile, for example, as prelude to someone being eaten by one of them, works the same way as a lighting change and a crash of thunder heralds the pantomime villain glowering in the wings. But perhaps more importantly, small details are a great delight of the book. It feels like the Pickwick Papers, like a universe more than a novel. Mungo's agony and doom is feeling like he has to get to the end of the Niger, but luckily we as the readers can paddle or enjoy trailing our hand in the water as he rows maniacally. It's a it's a riot, and um, in reading, in preparing for our long, our headlong um, foray into 18th century literature, it's fun to read something like that that's, that's taken the piss out of it all and set in set in the right time. So, are there any similarities between between water world and water music? <laughs> um, I mean, it's over the top. So, yes. Well, Nessie makes an appearance, so I was assuming it would be a bit Nessie hyper... Makes an is, w- would it be fair to call it hyper-realistic? In the sense that it's said in this realistic setting, but there's more so. It's more like as rich as it could possibly be. It's, it's almost... It's, it's, it's such fun to read because it's mimicking and mocking 18th century novels and the, the excesses and, and the fatness of those novels. Um, you know, endless diversions into scraps of essays written by a less fortunate explorer that went before, apologias, poems, that kind of thing. And just a general revelry in, like, uh, bodies and disgust and, you know, everything from run-down, nasty, depraved London Uh to terrifying um, alien lands that a frightened boy from Selkirk doesn't understand. (laughs) And there's lots of, you know, sex and body of course. And effluvia, that kind of thing. So, yeah, very over the top in a fun way. Okay, so that's a recommendation. Definitely a recommendation, yeah. Mm. It is sometimes said that all art aspires to the condition of music. Henry Fielding described Joseph Andrews in his preface as a comic epic poem in prose. That, too, would be a fitting description of water music. The river is a murmur, a pulse, a dream of the body. Schools of dace and shiners ebbing like blood. The tick, tick, tick of an arrested branch as persistent as a heartbeat. 
Rivers link the fate of all the characters and provide major moments in their lives. Ned's life transforms after a dunk in the Thames, a resurrection and not his only one, that darkly foreshadows his lover Fanny's committing suicide by jumping off a bridge. Mungo, of course, is obsessed with the Niger, and when he finally finds it, it envelops him like a mother's embrace. There's something going on with the mothers of water music. The Niger might embrace Mungo like a mother now, but it will also kill him. Similarly, a sinister mother figure haunts the novel. She appears in several guises and on both continents to sev- and to several characters, but she has a particular hold on Ned Rise. We first see her as an old crone, her face a memento mori, yet she is ageless and apparently horribly experienced. Whether she protects or torments Ned is not entirely clear. So yeah, his life story is one strand of water music. The second is um, a fictional character called Ned Rise, this cockney in, uh, in London. Uh, mm-hmm. No good rogue who ends up enlisted into Mungo's second expedition. Okay. But for most of the story, um, they're separated. Ned, like many characters, comes in for a lot of violence. In fact, the whole novel trembles with pummelings. Evidence of violence is everywhere. From characters having a hyphenated scar across the bridge of his nose to others that wear their scars like chevrons. And there is a kind of violent brutishness in some description. The overall effect is vegetal. He looks like nothing so much as a colossal turnip. Life is very cheap in water music. Like the beatings Sancho Panza or the Dromeos in Comedy of Errors take, They lose in force what they gain in volume. There is, however, one moment of violence which is genuinely chilling and all the more impressive for being late on after many a bludgeoning. If you have read Water Music already, or if this um, podcast prompts you to, please let me know what you think it is when you get to the end of the book, because I'd love to hear if it had the same effect on you as it did me. It's not as detailed as some of the other violent moments, but all the more grim for it. Whilst Mungo recuperates and grows restless in Peebles, Ned is sentenced to hang for accidentally killing a character called Lord Twit, a member of the African Association. And through this act, we learn how our two protagonists are connected by a twit. And in fact, Ned is hanged, but like Lazarus, rises again. Um, And there's some great bits in Scotland, not just meeting Walter Scott, but um, meeting another famous Scottish figure of legend, Literally Nessie. Here's a lovely link to a previous episode of Ear Read This. After Mungo leaves on his second expedition, Georgie Glegg takes Ailey to stay in Inverness, where, like Boswell and Johnson before them, they put up at Mackenzie's Inn. If you haven't heard it already, Adam and I earlier in the year did an episode on Boswell and Johnson's Scottish tour, um, so check that out if you haven't heard it. And whilst we're in Scotland, Boyle has displays a great ear for Scots pronunciation and makes the point that the surname Park is locally rendered as Paddock. Anyway, back to um, The Dark Interior. Yes. That's the book he published. Um... Mungo called his book The Dark Interior. No, he didn't. He called it Travels in, in, uh, Travels in the Interior of Africa. Okay. But there's, it is the, the age of the, you know, travelling through the dark interior, sure. the dark continent, all of that. Uh-huh. This is just when... Uh, the uh, boom of African exploration is about to hit. It's actually, you know, after Mungo's death. Spoiler alert! But he um, he has a brief period of of um, relaxation. He goes to Peebles, becomes a physician. So he he, he finally finished his medical training. Um, I think he did that before the Sumatra trip, yeah. um, and then uh, hangs out with Walter Scott. Well, oh, cool. But um, he has a sort of classic. Just when I thought I'd got out. They dragged me back in. And they forced him to do some more exploring. Yeah, they basically said, you know, you never did... um, Finish mapping the Niger. You know, now that it's not too soon to say this and, you you know, your feet have got better and you haven't got such awful dysentery um, and the nightmares have started to go away, we do want to sort of bridge the awkward... Why would would it have to be him again? Well, I mean, at this point, he's mapped more of the Niger than any white man alive. So he's the best qualified... Guy. Okay, so they send it literally is like an action movie. So they send I'm not going back in there. So they Jack. send a man with probable PTSD back into the yeah, source yeah. of his trauma. I can hear it in my dreams. A rustling, a tinkling, a sound of music. You know what it is? The Niger. Rushing, falling, heaving towards its hidden mouth, towards the sea. That's what I hear, Ailey, day and night. Music. Water music the novel, like water music, the piece by Handel is divided into three sections. The third or the return to the Niger, opens with a quote from Dante. It is Virgil counselling, your own good sense must be your guide. 
But Mungo has long forfeited his own good sense. Ned sees his shortcomings, his arrogance and his nihilism. In this third section, we see Mungo not as a hapless hero, but a truly terrifying, blinkered leader, risking not just his own life, but those of his men, not to mention causing untold havoc by entering unknown territory. It doesn't help that local conditions have worsened in his absence. At the turn of the 19th century, the west coast of Africa, from Dakar to the Bight of Benin, had a reputation for pestilence and rot unequalled anywhere in the world. Galaxies of insects await them. The transformation of Mungo into this terrible figure, a foretaste of colonialism to come, is the dramatic rug pull of the book. He has, via a people's interlude, become a character from high tragedy. Nothing will convince us he is not doomed, not even the resurrection of Johnson, crocodile scarred, using a different name, but nonetheless alive. And this time, he wants Milton, Dryden and Pope as payment, and the last one better be signed. The journey into the interior with a dying crew and in increasingly desperate conditions is truly hellish. Days flit past, strung tight as a crossbow through the long seer afternoons, then released in the shank of the evening with a whoosh of falling sun and rising mist. Um, does he die there, I'm assuming? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the second one is an absolute shit show. Well, so. Yeah, because the, I think they would have, hopefully they would have learned some lessons from the first one. So he leads this first one. Um, he starts off with uh, 40 men, I think. And then within all a very short amount of time, they'd lost most of them. Jesus. Dysentery, fever, all of that stuff again. Constantly attacked by um, Moorish tribes. Well, I think I've, it's through the actions of great British heroes like Mungo that allowed Britain to so effectively pillage Africa. <laughs> yeah. We want a good map before we go in. We want to know where all the good stuff is we so actually, we can do we it quick. We need to know where all the shit is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until something like 25 years after his death that um, they finally mapped the Niger and saw it. How, it how did, you, did, you, did you find out how they did it in the end, without everybody dying? A guy called Houghton. Houghton. Okay. Um, so just a better explorer. Just a better explorer, yeah. Maybe a more <laughs> sensible one. Oh, actually, no, maybe it wasn't Houghton. Maybe it was um, a guy called Lander. Okay. Um, but yeah, another explorer. Someone actually finished the job. Someone actually, yeah, finished the job and was... Um, and I think Mungo was quite, he had this theory that the Congo and the Niger had had a common source. Interesting. Um, That's not correct, though. Which is not correct. No. The real-life Mungo set off for his second trip on the 31st of January, 1805. He left from Portsmouth with his brother-in-law, three officers and 40 Europeans. By August, 11 of these have survived. By November, it's down to him, an officer and three soldiers, one of whom has gone insane, a guide, and three slaves. As the, as the survivors sailed along, they avoided, they pointedly avoided contact with tribes. But at the Busa Rapids, they got stranded, and Mungo drowned, trying to escape an attack. Mungo's obsession is evident from a letter he sent en route to his second voyage. I shall set sail for the east with a fixed resolution to discover the termination of the Niger, or perish in the attempt. Though all the Europeans who are with me should die, and though I were myself half dead, I would still persevere, and if I could not succeed in the object of my journey, I would at least die on the Niger. So he did, and 12 years later, his son set out to discover what had happened to Mungo, but died of fever very early on. Ned Rise is luckier. He awakes on a bank, with strange music playing in his ears, thinking to himself, it begins again. But the Niger goes on, through rolling hills and treeless plains, playing over the shallows like fingers on a keyboard, stirring the reeds with a strange and unearthly music, flowing on, all the way to the sea. Is there any good bits on boats? Oh, tons. Yeah. Yeah. But as in, like, travelling to. That's always my favourite part of the adventure. Have you seen Apocalypse now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot going on. I, I love... That. That's my favourite bit of Apocalypse now, the bits where they're just going up the river. Mm. And they're just like, we're going up the river to the next bit of symbolism. <laughs> so I saw the extended cut which has a bit in the French colonies I've seen that yeah so there's like there's a bit where they got the river and there's the French colony they got the river and then there's the the bridge that they that is blown up every night and they rebuild it just to say that they took it and then there's the bit where they get attacked by the tiger and there's just all these little bits that happen on the river yeah I forgot about the tiger yeah I, don't know, I think that's my similar in Heart of Darkness where they're just on the boat for a while and they get off the boat yeah Similar in um, Anaconda. Have you seen Anaconda? Is that that shit horror film? Shit. Is that the one about the giant... The classic John Voight, LL Cool J, 
Anaconda <laughs> horror film from the 90s. Why have you seen Anaconda? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I was, I don't know, when, whenever I first saw that, I, I was in a phase of going around to friends' houses and watching movies just like on repeat oh. and just putting another one on as soon as the one ended. It was one a those, wild and crazy time. <laughs> one of those was Anaconda. Well, no, w- one of those was Apocalypse Now and then one of them later was Anaconda. And I vividly remember waking up at one point and thinking I was on the same boat, but suddenly the cast had all changed. You watched Anaconda and Apocalypse Now on the yeah, same yeah. night. and thought they thought they were the same <laughs> film. <laughs> they started to bleed into one another. Um, mm. I actually can't remember if it was Anaconda or <clears throat> Anaconda's... There is the sequel. There's a few. I think there's that. That should be a that, sh- that should be like a triple billing. You watch um, Apocalypse Now, you watch Fitzcarraldo, <laughs> and, and you watch Anaconda Anaconda you watch films. three Anaconda films. <laughs> yeah. A Night on the River. Yeah. The Hunt for the Blood Orchid was um, the subtitle. Oh God. If you've got any favourite. Um, going up a boat in the jungle. Favorite films. <laughs> going up the jungle in a boat films. Please send them in because. <laughs> I think I'd always watch one, to be honest. If I saw a trailer and they're going up the jungle in a boat, I think I'm in. I feel like there's, I feel like there's a big one we're missing. Yeah, probably. Um, I think Apocalypse Now is the big one. Is, is, we, is the film about going the up the jungle in a boat. If we turned all of this stuff off and went, oh, fuck. We didn't talk about Apocalypse Now. We'd probably cut now. it out. <laughs> but if we think, like, oh, we didn't talk about African Queen 2. This, Mosquito Coast. Yeah, Mosquito Coast. One. Are there any good films about trying to find the source of the Nile? Niger. Well, no, but as in the Nile. Oh, that's, the Nile. That's, that's the, that was the famous one. Yeah. Um, People tried for ages to find the source. Now I'm just thinking of boats and, and rivers, death on the Nile. Death on the, the Nile. What, the, the Agatha Christie? Yeah. Yeah. That's used enough, isn't it? The film version. I've never actually seen the film version. Oh. I've seen the um, I've seen the David Suchet oh, yeah. <laughs> the TV version of it, which I think is the best. And they're making another one. Oh, is it with with um, Kenneth Branagh. Yeah. Did you like that? No, I, I absolutely hated it. Do you remember when we first started this podcast? We were talking about um, we were talking about we we're either going to do Lincoln in the Bardo or uh, Murder on the Orient Express. Okay. And I said, I don't, I didn't really disliked the murder on the orient express because i hadn't, hadn't read it before uh-huh. but I, I said to you like i just went to see the film and i was just feeling so down and about it i don't want our first podcast to just be like what a piece of shit and then we talked about lincoln in the bardo and then we talked about like, lincoln in the bardo which is a real piece of uh, it's aged in no way whatsoever because i can barely remember it what lincoln in the bardo yeah. yeah did you think that film was any good <sighs> no. no um good it it tried I tried to do something different because it's very, very hard to beat the David Suchet one mm. because it is a straight adaptation of the book and all the characters are great and the story's told properly and it all works. So it's very hard to try and do it again but make it different for the difference's sake. Mm. Do you know how I would have done it? Why? Sci-fi. Oh. Sci-fi? Sci-fi. Um, space cruise. Space cruise or space train. But I think that I, I think there's significant mileage in doing a murder mystery on a, on a space station. Is Hercule Poirot a robot? Hercule Pro 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 Bot. Probe. <laughs> Hercule Pro Bot. <laughs> Hercule Pro Bot. With his metallic moustache. Yeah. Oh, I think we've got a like, Christmas special. <laughs> Brilliant, actually. Murder yeah. in the Orient Express. In space. Uh, murder on the Murder on the Mars Express. Yeah. So, a final word on Water Music by TC Boyle. Well, have I, I, I suppose. I mean, I'm definitely recommending it. I, I loved it. But uh, have, well, this, have I convinced you to go and. Well, this, is, this is a weird one. This is the first time that I've got literally no background on the book. Mm. All I, I never even heard of the book, apart from just having seen it about, yeah. aside from you talking about it all the time. And I'd not heard about it from anyone else either. You're the only person I know who's, uh, really? who's heard of it. Not, 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 not that I've been going around asking, but I've mm. never heard anyone, bring it, anyone else bring it up either. So this was almost complete blanket ignorance. And you have sold it to me. Good. My job as a podcaster is done. Yeah. For today. For today. Thank you for listening to Read This. Um, If you want to keep in touch, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and you can send us an email at eareadthis at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at eareadthis. Um, We also now have a a Patreon page, our October episode, which is about the first story, the creation story from Ovid's Metamorphoses. will be on there very soon. If you want to catch that, visit patreon.com slash you read this we'll be back with a halloween special in a few days happy reading all 
all day I faced a barren 